Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, Chapter 12, The Mirror of Erised Christmas was coming. One morning in mid-December, Hogwarts woke to find itself covered in several feet of snow. The lake froze solid, and the Weasley twins were punished for bewitching several snowballs so they followed Quirrell around, bouncing off the back of his turban. The few owls that had managed to battle their way through the stormy sky to deliver post had to be nursed back to health by Hagrid before they could fly off again. No one could wait for the holidays to start. While the Gryffindor common room and the Great Hall had roaring fires, the drafty corridors had become a, become icy and bitter wind rattled the windows in the classrooms. Worst of all were Professor Snape's classes down in the dungeons, where their breath rose in a mist before them. They kept as close as possible to their hot cauldrons. I feel so. I do feel sorry, said Draco Malfoy, one of the potions class. For all those people who have to stay at Hogwarts for Christmas because they're not wanted at home. He was looking over at Harry as he spoke. Crab and Goyle chuckled. Harry, who was measuring out powdered, oh, powdered spine of lionfish, ignored them. Malfoy had been in such an unpleasant mood than usual since the Quidditch match. Disgusted that Slytherin had lost, he had tried every to get everyone laughing at how the wide mouth <clears throat> how a wide mouth tree frog would be replacing Harry as seeker next. Then he realised that nobody found this funny, because they were all so impressed at the way that Harry had managed to stay on his bucking broomstick. So, Malfoy, jealous and angry, had gone back to taunting Harry about having no proper family. It was true that Harry wasn't going back to, to Privet Drive for Christmas. Professor McGonagall had come round the week before, making a list of students who were staying for the holidays. Harry had signed up at once. He didn't feel sorry for himself at all. Um... This would probably be the best Christmas he'd ever had. Ron and his brothers were also staying too, because Mr. and Mrs. Weasley were going to Romania to visit Charlie. When they um, left the dungeons at the end of potions, they found a large fir tree blocking the corridor ahead. Two enormous feet were sticking out of the bottom, and a loud puffing sound told them that Hagrid was behind him. Hi, Hagrid. Want any help? Ron asked, sticking his head through the branches. Nah, I'm all right, thanks, Ron. Would you mind moving out of the way? Came Malfoy's cold drawl from behind them. Are you trying to earn some extra money, Weasley, hoping to be gamekeeper yourself when you leave Hogwarts? I suppose um, the, I suppose that that hut of Hagrid's must seem like a palace compared to what your family's used to. Ron dived at Malfoy just as Snape came up the stairs. Malfoy, I mean, sorry, Weasley. Ron let go of Ma the front of Malfoy's robes. Um... He was provoked, Professor Snape, said Hagrid, sticking his huge hairy face out from behind the tree. Malfoy's insulting his family. Be as it may, fighting against fighting is against Hogwarts rules, Hagrid, said Snape silkily. Five points from Gryffindor, Weasley. Be grateful it isn't more. Move along, all of you. Malfoy and Goyle pro pushed roughly past the tree, scattering needles everywhere and smirking. I'll get him, said Ron, grinding his teeth at Malfoy's back. One of these days, I'll get him. I hate them both, Harry said. Malfoy and Snape. Come on, cheer up, it's nearly Christmas, said Hagrid. Tell you what, um, come with me and see the Great Hall. It looks a treat. So Ro Harry, Ron and Hermione followed Hagrid and his tree off to the Great Hall, where Professor McGonagall and Professor Flitwick were busy with Christmas decorations. Ah, Hagrid, the last tree. Put it in the far corner, would you? The hall looked spectacular. Festoons of holly and mistletoe hang around the walls, and no fewer than twelve towering Christmas trees stood around the room, some sparkling with tiny icicles, some glittering with hundreds of candles. How many days you got left until your holidays? Hagrid said. Just one, said Hermione. And that reminds me, Harry, Ron, we've got half an hour before lunch. Should we go to the um, library? Um, sorry, we should be in the library. Ah, oh, yeah, you're right, said Ron, tearing his eyes away from Professor Pl Flitwick, who had golden ball, uh, golden bubbles blossoming out of his wand, trailing them over the branches of a new tree. The library, said, um, said Hagrid, fol following them out of the hall, just before the holidays. Bit keen, aren't you? Oh, uh, we're not working. Um, Harry told him brightly, ever since you mentioned Nicholas Formal, we've been trying to find out who he was. You what? Hagrid looked shocked. Listen here, I told you, drop it. It's nothing to you what that dog's guarding. 
We just want to know who look at Nicholas Flamel is, that's all, said Hermione. Unless you'd like to tell us and save us all the trouble, said Harry added. We must have been through hundreds of books already, and we can't find it anywhere. Just give us a hint. I know I've read his name somewhere. I'm saying nothing, said Hagrid flatly. Just have to find out ourselves then, said Ron, and they left Hagrid looking disgruntled and hurried off to the library. They had indeed been searching books for Nicholas Fermel's name ever since Hagrid let it slip. Because somehow they were going to find out what, because how else were they going to find out what Snape was trying to steal? The trouble was, it was very hard to know where to begin, not knowing what Flamel might, uh, might have done to get himself into a book. He wasn't in the great wizards of the 20th century, or notable magic names of our time. He was missing, too, from important modern magical discoveries and a study of recent developments in wizardry. And then, of course, there was the sheer size of the library, tens and th of thousands of books, thousands of shelves, hundreds of narrow rows. Um, Hermione took out a list of subjects and titles she decided to search while Ron strode um, off down a row of books and started pulling them out of the shelves at random. Harry wandered over to the restricted section. He had been wondering for a while if Flamel wasn't somewhere in there. Unfortunately, he needed a specially signed note from one of the teachers to look in any of the restricted books and he knew he'd never get one. There were... Books containing powerful dark magic never taught at Hogwarts, only read by um, older students studying advanced defence against the dark arts. Uh, what are you looking for, boy? Nothing, said Harry. Madame Pince, the librarian, brandished a le feather duster for him. Um, you better get out then. Go on, out. Wishing he'd been a bit quicker at thinking up some story, Harry left the library. He, Ron, and Hermione had agreed they'd better not ask Madame Pince where they could find Flamel. They were, were sure she'd be able to tell them, but they couldn't risk Snape hearing what they were up to. Um, Harry waited outside the corridor to see if the other two had found anything, but he wasn't very hopeful. They had been looking for a fortnight, after all. Uh, they had been looking for a fortnight after all, but as they were only had odd moments between lessons, it wasn't surprising they'd found nothing. What they really needed was a nice long search without Madame Pince breathing down their necks. Five minutes later, Ron and Hermione joined them, shaking their heads. They went off to lunch. You will, you will keep looking while I'm away, won't you? said Hermione, and send me an owl if you find anything. And you could ask your parents if they know who... Flamel is, said Ron. It'd be safe to ask them. Very safe, as they're both dentists, said Hermione. Once the holidays had started, Harry and Ron were having too much of a good time to think about Flamel. They had the dormitory to themselves. The common room was far emptier than usual, so they were able to get the good armchairs. They sat by the hour, eating everything they could spear on a toasting fork. Bread, crumpets and marshmallows, plotting ways of getting Malfoy expelled which were fun to talk about even if they wouldn't work. Ron also started teaching Harry wizard's chess, which was exactly like muggle chess, except the figures were alive, which made it a lot like directing troops in battle. Ron's set was very old and battered, like everything else he owned. It had once belonged to someone else in his family, in this case, his grandfather. However, old chessmen weren't, draw weren't a drawback at all. Ron knew them so well, he'd never get never had trouble getting them to do what he wanted. Harry played with Chessman. Oh, Harry played with Chessman Seamus Finnegan. Um, had lent him... Oh, sorry. Harry played with Chessman she Seamus Finnegan had lent him, and they didn't trust him at all. He wasn't very good. It wasn't a very good play yet, and it kept shouting different bits of advice at him, uh, which was confusing. Don't send me there. Can't you see... His knight. Send him. We can afford to lose him. On Christmas Eve, Harry went to bed, looking forward to the next day for the food and the fun, not expecting any presents at all. When he woke early the next morning, however, the first thing he noticed was a small pile of packages at the foot of his bed. Happy Christmas, said Ron sleepily, as Harry scrambled out of his bed, pulling on his dressing gown. You too. Will you look at this? I got some presents. What did you expect? Turnips? said Ron, turning to his own pile, which was a lot bigger than Harry's. Harry picked up the top parcel. 
It was wrapped in thick brown paper. Scrawled across it was to Harry from Hagrid. Inside was a roughly cut wooden flute. Hagrid had awfully, uh, obviously whittled it himself. Harry blew it. It sounded a bit like an owl. A second, very small <clears throat> uh, parcel contained a note. We received your message and enclosed your Christmas present from Ron and Aunt, sorry, from Uncle Van and Aunt Petunia. Sellotape to the note was a 50 pence pea. That's friendly, said Harry. Um, Ron was fascinated by the 50 pence. Weird, what a shape. This is money. You can keep it, said Harry, laughing at how Ron, how, how pleased Ron was. Haggard and my aunt and uncle. Who, so who sent these? I think I know who that one's from, said Ron, going a bit pink, pointing it to a very lumpy parcel. My mum, I told her you didn't expect any presents, so, and, oh no, she's made you a Weasley jumper. Um, Ron, sorry, Harry had torn open a parcel to find a thick hand-knitted sweater in emerald green and a large box of homemade fudge. Every year she makes us a jumper, said Ron, unwrapping his own, and mine's always maroon. That's very, really nice of her, said Harry, trying the fudge, which was very tasty. His next pe present also contained sweet. A large box of chocolate frogs from Hermione. Uh, this left only one parcel. Harry picked it up and felt it. It was very light. He unwrapped it. Something fluid and silvery went slithering onto the floor, where it lay in gleaming folds. Um, I've heard of those, he said in a hushed voice, dropping the box of every flavour beans he got from Hermione. If that's what I think it is, they're really rare and really valuable. What is it? Harry picked up the shining silvery cloth off the floor. It was strange to the touch, like water woven into material. It's an invisibility cloak, said Ron, with a look of awe on his face. I'm sure it is. Try it on. Harry threw the cloak around his shoulders. Ron gave a yell. It is! Look down! Um, Harry looked down at his feet, but they had gone. He dashed to the mirror. Sure enough, his reflection looked back at him, just his head suspended in midair his body completely invisible. He pulled the cloak over his head and his reflection vanished completely. There's a note, said Ron suddenly. A note fell out of it. Harry pulled off the cloak and seized a letter, written in narrow, loopy handwriting he'd never seen before, were the following words. Your father left this in my possession before he died. It's time it was returned to you. Use it well. A very Merry Christmas to you. There was no signature. Harry stared at the note. Rohan was admiring the cloak. I'd give, uh, give anything for one of those. Anything. What's the matter? Nothing, said Harry strangely. Um, he felt very weird. Who had sent the cloak? Had it really once belonged to his father? Before he could say or think anything else, the dormitory door was flung open by Fred and George Weasley. Harry stuffed the cloak quiet, quick, quickly out of sight. He didn't feel like sharing it with anyone else. Merry Christmas. Hey, look, we Harry's got a Weasley jumper too. Fred and George were wearing blue jumpers, one with a large F, uh, with a large yellow F on it, the other with a large yellow G. Harry's is better than ours, though, said Fred, holding up Harry's jumper. She obviously, obviously makes more of an effort if, if you're not in the family. Um, why aren't you wearing yours, Ron? George demanded. Come on, get it on. They're lovely and warm. I hate maroon, Ron ha moaned half-heartedly as he pulled it over his head. You haven't got a, a letter on yours, George observed. I suppose she thinks you don't don't forget your name, but, but we're not stupid. We know we're called Gred and Forge. What's all this noise? Percy Weasley stuck his head uh, through the door, looking disapproving. He had clearly come halfway through unwrapping his presents too, as he too carried a lumpy jumper over his arm, which Fred seized. P for Prefect. Come on, Percy. Well, we're all wearing ours. Even Harry got one. I don't want, said Percy thickly as the twins forced a jumper over his head, knocking his glasses askew. And you're not sitting with the Prefects today either, um, said George. Christmas time is for family. They frog marched Percy from the room, his arms pinned to his side by his jumper. Harry had never in all his life had such a Christmas dinner. A hundred fat roast turkeys, mounts of roast and boiled potatoes, platters of fat chipolatas, 
tureens of buttered peas, silver boats of thick, rich gravy and cranberry sauce, and stacks of wizard crackers every few feet along the table. These fantastic crackers were nothing like the feeble muggle ones the Dursleys usually bought, with their little plastic toys and their flimsy paper hats. Harry pulled a wizard cracker with Fred, and it didn't just bang, it went off with a blast like a cannon, engulfed them in a cloud of blue smoke, uh, while from the inside exploded a rear admiral's hat and several live white mice. Up on the high table, Dumbledore had swapped his pointy wizard's hat for a flowered bonnet and was chuckling merrily at a joke Professor Flitwick had just read him. Flaming Christmas puddings followed the turkey. Percy nearly broke his teeth on a silver sickle embedded in his slice. Harry watched Hagrid get redder and redder in the face as he called for more wine, finally kissing um, Professor McGonagall on the cheek, who, to Harry's amazement, giggled and blushed, her top hat lopsided. When Harry finally left the table, he was laden with a stack of things out of the crackers, including a pack of non-explodable illuminous balloons, and grow your own wart kit, and his new wizard uh, his own new wizard's chest set. White, the white mice had disappeared, and Harry had a nasty feeling they were going to end up as Mrs. Norris's Christmas dinner. Harry and the Weasleys spent a happy afternoon ha uh, get, having, furious, uh, having a furious snowball fight in the grounds. Then, cold, wet, and gasping for breath, they returned to the fire in the Gryffindor common room, where Harry broke in his new chess set by losing spectacularly to Ron. He suspected he wouldn't have lost so badly if Percy hadn't tried to help him so much. After a tea of turkey sandwiches, crumble, crumpets, trifle, and Christmas cake, everyone felt too full and sleepy to do much before bed, except to sit and watch Percy chase Fred and George all over the Gryffindor Tower because they'd stole his prefect badge. It had been Harry's best Christmas day ever, yet something had been nagging in the back of his mind all day. Not until he climbed into bed was he free to, free to think about it. The invisibility cloak, and whoever had sent it. Ron, full of turkey and cake, with nothing mysterious to bother him, fell asleep almost as soon as he'd drawn the curtains of his full post to bed. Harry leant over, his si Harry leant over the side of his bed and pulled the cloak out from underneath it. His father's. This had been his father's. He let the material... Uh, flow over his hands, smoother than silk, light as air. Use it well, the note had said. He had to try it now. He slipped out of bed and wrapped the cloak around himself. Looking down at his legs, he saw only moonlight and shadows. It was a funny feeling. Use it well. Suddenly, Harry felt wide awake, and the whole of Hogwarts was open to him in his cloak. Excitement flooded through him as he stood there in the dark and silence. He could go anywhere in in this, anywhere, and Filch would never know. Ron grunted in his sleep. Should Harry wake him? Something held him back, his father's cloak. He felt that this time, the first time, he wanted to use it alone. He crept out of the dormitory, down the stairs, across the common room, and through the portrait hole. Who's there? squawked the fat lady. Harry said nothing. He walked quickly down the corridor. Where should he go? He stopped, his heart racing in thought. Then it came to him. The restricted section in the library. He'd be able to read as long as he liked, as long as it took um, to find out who Flamel was. <laughs> he set off, drawing the invisible cloak tight around him as he walked. The library was pitch black and very eerie. He lit a lamp to see his way along the rows of books. The lamp looked as if it was floating in midair. Even though Harry could feel his arm supporting him, the, light, the sight gave him the creeps. Um... The restricted section was right at the back of the library. Stepping carefully over a rope which separated these books from the rest of the library, he held up his lamp to read the title. They didn't tell him much. Their, pa their peeling faded gold letters spelled words in languages Harry couldn't understand. Some had no title at all. One book had a dark stain on it that looked horribly like blood. The hairs on the back of Harry's neck prickled. Maybe he was imagining it. Maybe not. But he thought he had a faint whispering um, was coming from the books, as though they knew someone was there who shouldn't be. He had to start somewhere. Um, setting the lamp down carefully on the floor, he looked along the bottom shelf for an interesting-looking book. 
a large black and silver volume caught his eye. He pulled it out with difficulty, because it was very heavy, bounced it on his knee and let it fall open. A piercing blood-curdling scream split the silence. The book was screaming. Uh, Harry snapped it shut, but the streak went, spree shriek went on and on. One high, unbroken, ear-splitting note. He stumbled backwards, knocking over his lamp, which went over at once. Panicking, he heard footsteps coming down the corridor outside. Shuffling past the three shrieking book, um, he ran for it. He passed Filch, almost in the doorway. Filch's pale, wild eyes looking straight through him. Harry slipped under Filch's outstretched arm and streaked up off the up the corridor. The book shrieks were still ringing in his ear. Um, he came to a sudden halt in front of a tall suit of armour. He had been so busy getting away from the library, he hadn't paid attention to where he was going. Perhaps it was because it was dark. Um, he didn't recognise where he was at all. There was a suit of armour near the kitchens, he knew, but he must be five floors above there. He, you asked me to come directly to you, Professor, if anyone was wandering around at night. Um, somebody's been in the library, restricted section. Harry felt the blood drain out of his face. Wherever he was, Filch must know a shortcut, because his... Soft, greasy voice was getting nearer. To his horror, it was Snake who replied. The restricted section. Well, they can't be far now. We'll catch them. Harry stood rooted to the spot as Filch and Snape came round the corner ahead. They couldn't see him, of course, but it was a narrow corridor, and if they came much nearer, they'd knock right into him. The cloak didn't stop him from being solid. He backed away as quietly as he could. Um... He squeezed through it. Uh, oh, sorry. A door stood ajar to his left. He squeezed through it, holding his breath, trying to, not to move it. And to his relief, he managed to get inside the room without their noticing anything. They walked straight past, and Harry leant against the wall, breathing deeply, listening to their footsteps dying away. That had been close, very close. It was a few seconds before he noticed anything about the room he'd hidden in. It looked like a disused classroom. The dark shapes of desks and chairs were piled against the walls and there was an upturned waste paper basket but propped against the wall facing him was something that didn't look as if it belonged there something that looked as if someone had just put it there to keep it out of the way it was a magnificent um mirror as high as the ceiling with ornate an old an, an ornate gold frame standing on two clawed feet there was an inscription carved around the top Ere said stra ehru oit ube kafru oit on hu husi. His panic now fading, there was no sound of Felch and Snape. Harry moved nearer to the mirror, wanting to look at it, look at himself, but seen a reflection in it. Um, he stepped in front of it. He had to clap. Um. He had to clap his hands to his mouth to stop himself from screaming. He whirled around. His heart was uh, pounding far more furiously than the whole book had, than the book had screamed. For he had seen not only himself in the mirror, but a whole crowd of people standing right behind him. The mirror was empty, but sorry, but the room was empty. Breathing fast, he turned slowly back to the mirror. There he was, reflected in, white, scared looking, and there. Reflected behind him were at least ten others. Harry looked over his shoulder, but still, no one was there. Or were they all invisible? Was he, in fact, in a room full of invisible people? Um, and this mirror's trick was that it reflected them, invisible or not? He looked in the mirror again. A woman standing right behind him, uh, right behind its reflection, was smiling and waving at him. He reached out a hand and felt the air behind him. If she was really there, he'd touch her. Their reflections were so close together, but he felt only air. She and the others existed only in the mirror. She was a very pretty woman. She had dark red hair and her eyes. Her eyes are just like mine, Harry thought. Edging a little closer to the glass, bright green, exactly the same shape. Um, then he noticed that she was crying, smiling, but crying at the same time. A tall, thin, black-haired man, standing next to her, put his arm around her. He wore glasses, and his hair was untidy. 
and stuck up at the back just like Harry's did. He was so close to the mirror now that his nose was nearly touching that of his reflection. Mum, he whispered. Dad? They both looked at him smiling, and slowly Harry saw... Harry looked into the faces of the other people, um, and saw other pairs of green eyes like his, other noses like his, even an old man who looked as though he'd had Harry's knobbly knees. Harry was looking at his family. For the first time in his life, the potter smiled and waved at Harry as he stared hungrily back at them, his hands pressed flat against the glass as though he was hoping to fall right through it and reach them. He had a powerful kind of ache inside him. Half joy, half terrible sadness. How long he stood there, he didn't know. The reflections did not fade. Um, and he looked and looked until a distant noise uh, brought him back to his senses. He couldn't stay there. He had to find his way back to bed. Um, he tore his eyes away from his mother's face and whispered, I'll come back and hurried from the room. You could have woken me up, said Ron crossly. You can come tonight. I'm going back. I want to show you the mirror. I'd like to see your mum and dad, Ron said eagerly. And I want to see all your family, all the Weasleys. You'll be able to show me your bro other brothers and everyone. You can see them any, any old time, said Ron. Just come round my house, to my house this summer. Anyway, maybe, it's, uh, maybe it only shows dead people. Shame about not finding Flamel, though. Have some bacon or something. Why aren't you eating anything? Um, Harry couldn't eat. He had seen his parents and, he'd, and would be seeing them again tonight. He'd almost forgotten about Femal. It didn't seem important anymore. Who cared about the three-headed dog? Who cared what the three-headed dog was guarding? What did it matter if Snape stole it? Are you alright, said Ron? You look odd. Um... What what Harry feared the most was that he might not be able to find the mirror room again. Ron covered in the cloak too. With Ron covered in the cloak too, they had to walk much more slowly the next night. They tried retracing Harry's route from the library, wandering through dark passageways for nearly an hour. I'm freezing, said Ron. Let's forget it and go back. No, Harry hissed. I know it's here somewhere. They passed the ghost of a tall witch gliding in the opposite direction, but no one else. Just as Harry Ron started moaning that his feet were dead with cold, Harry spotted the suit of armour. It's here, just here. Yes. They pushed the door open. Harry dropped the cloak from around, from around his shoulders and ran to the mirror. There they were, his mother and father beaming at the sight of him. See? Harry whispered. I can't see anything. Look at them. Look, look at them all. There are loads of them. I can only see you. Look in it properly. Stand where I am. Harry stepped aside, but with Ron in front of the mirror. He couldn't see his family anymore. Just Ron in his palesy pyjamas. Ron, though, was staring transfixed at his image. Look at me, he said. Can you see all your family standing around you? No, I'm alone. But I'm different. I look older and I'm head boy. What? I, I am, I'm wearing the badge like Bill used to. I'm holding the house cup and the Quidditch cup too. I'm the cap Quidditch captain. Ron tore his eyes away from the sp splendid sight to look excitedly at Harry. Do you think this mirror shows the future? How can it? All my family are dead. Let me have another look. You had it all to yourself last night. Give me a bit more. You're only holding the Quidditch cup. What's so interesting about that? Um, the sudden noise outside the corridor put an end to their discussion. They hadn't realised how loudly they'd been talking. Quick, Ron threw the cloak back over him as the luminous eyes of Mrs Norris came through the door. Um, Ron and Harry stood quite still, uh, both thinking the same thing. Did the cloak work on cats? Um, after what seemed an age, she turned and left. This isn't safe. She might have gone for Filch. I bet she heard us. Come on. And Ron pulled Harry out of the room. The snow still um, hadn't melted next morning. Want to play chess, Harry? Said Ron. No. Why don't we go down and visit Harry? Hagrid. No, you go. I know what you're thinking about, Harry. That mirror. Don't go back tonight. Why not? I don't know. I've got a bad feeling about it. Anyway, you've had too many close shaves already. Filch, Snape and Mrs Norris wandering around. 
So what if they can't see you? What if they walk into you? What if you knock something over? You sound like Hermione. I'm seriously, Harry. Don't go. But Harry had only one thought in his head, which was to get back in front of the mirror, and Ron wasn't going to stop him. Um, the third night, he found, uh, found this his way way more quickly than before. He was walking so fast, he knew he was making more noise than was wise, but he didn't meet anyone. There were his mother and father smiling at him, and one of his grandfathers no nodding happily. Harry sank down to sit on the front of the mirror. There was nothing to stop him staying there all night with his family. Nothing at all. Except, so, back again, Harry. Harry felt as though his insides had turned to ice. He looked behind him. Sitting on one of the desks by the wall was none other than Albus Dumbledore. Harry must have walked straight past him, so desperate to get to the mirror. He hadn't noticed. Um, I, di I didn't see you, sir. Strange how short-sighted being invisible can make you, said Dumbledore. Harry relieved to see he was smiling. So, said Dumbledore, slipping off the desk onto the floor with Harry, you, like hundreds did before, have discovered the delights of the mirror of Erised. I didn't know that I didn't know it was called that, sir. But I expect you've realized that by now what it does. Well, it shows me my family, and it showed it showed Ron himself as head boy. How'd you know? I don't need a cloak to become invisible, said Dumbledore gently. Now you can think what the mirror of error said shows us all. Harry shook his head. Let me explain. The happiest man on earth would be able to look in the mirror of Erised like a normal mirror. That's it. He would be able to look, to, look into it and see himself exactly as he is. Does that help? Harry thought. Then he said slowly, it shows us what we want, whatever we want. Yes and no, said Dumbledore quietly. It shows us nothing more or less than the deepest, most desperate desires of our hearts. You who have never known your own family, seeing them standing around you. Ron, Ronald Weasley, who has always been overshadowed by his brothers, sees himself standing alone, best of all of them. However, this mirror will give us neither knowledge nor truth. Men have wasted away before it, entranced by what they have seen, or driven mad, not knowing um, what it show, what, if what it shows is real or possible. The mirror will, meet, will be moved to a new home tomorrow. Harry, and I asked you, do not go looking for it. If you do ever run across it, you'll be prepared. It doesn't. It does not do to dwell on dreams and forget to live. Remember that, Harry. Now, why don't you put on that admirable cloak and get back off to bed? Um. Harry stood up. Sir, Professor Dumbledore, can I ask you something? Obviously, you've just done so. Dumbledore smiled. You may ask me one more thing, however. What do you see when you look in the mirror? I see myself holding a thick pair of woolen socks. Harry stared. You can never have enough socks, said Dumbledore. Another Christmas has come and gone, and I didn't get a single pair. People will insist on giving me books. It was only when he was back in bed that it struck that Dumbledore might not have been quite truthful. Then, he thought, as he shoved scabbers off his pillow, that he'd... he'd it had been quite a personal question.